Jorge Luis Borges, Fones, the Memorials. I remember him. I scarcely have the right to use this hostly verb. Only one man on earth deserved the right, and he is dead. I remember him with a dark passion flower in his hand, looking at it as no one has overlooked at such a flower, for they might look from the twilight of day until the twilight of night for a whole life long. I remember him, his face, immobile and Indian-like and singularly remote behind his cigarette. I remember, I believe, the strong, delicate fingers of the uh, plainsman who can braid leather. I remember near those hands a vessel in which to make mate tea bearing the arms of the Bondavarin Tal. I remember in a window of the house yellow rush mat and beyond a vague marshy landscape. I remember clearly his voice, the deliberate, resentful, nasal voice of the old Eastern Shore man without Italianate syllables of today. I didn't see him more than three times. The last time in 1887. That all those who knew him should write something about him seems to me very felicitous idea. My testimony may perhaps be the briefest and without doubt the poorest, and it will not be the least impartial. The deplorable fact of my being an Argentinian will uh, hinder me from falling into different, an obligatory form in the Uruguay than the term is an Uruguayan. Literature slicker Buenos Aires. Funes didn't use those insulting phrases, but I am sufficiently aware that for him I represented those unfortunate categories. Pedro Leandro Ipucci has written that Funes was a precursor of Superman, an untamed and vernacular Zaratustra. I don't doubt it, but one must not forget either that he was a countryman from the town of Frey Bentus with certain incurable limitations. My first recollection of Furness is quite clear. I see him at dusk uh, sometime in March, February of the year 84. That year my father had taken me to spend the summer at Frey Bentos. I was on my way back from the farm at San Francisco with my cousin Bernardo Haedo. We came back singing on horseback. And uh, this last fact was not the only reason for my joy. After a sultry day, an enormous slate gray storm had obscured the sky. It was driven on by a wind from the south. The trees were already tossing like madmen. And I had the apprehension, the secret hope, that the elemental downpour would catch us out in the open. We were running a kind of race with a tempest. We rode into narrow lane with wound down between two enormously high brick footpaths. It had grown black of a sudden. I now heard the rapid, almost secret steps above. 
I raised my eyes and saw a boy running along the narrow, cracked path as if it were running along a narrow, broken wall. I remember the loose trousers, tied at the bottom, the hemp sandals. I remember cigarette in a hard visage, standing out against the by now limitless darkness. Bernardo unexpectedly yelled to him, What's time, Ireneo? Without looking up, without stopping, Ireneo replied, In ten minutes it will be eight o'clock, child Bernardo Juan Francisco. The voice was sharp, mocking. I am so absent-minded that the dialogue which I have just cited would not have penetrated my attention if it had not been repeated by my cousin, who was stimulated, I think, by a certain local pride and by desire to show himself indifferent to the other's free-sided reply. He told me that the boy above us in the pass was a certain Ireneo furnace, renowned for a number of eccentricities, such as that of having nothing to do with people and of always knowing the time, like a watch. He added that Ireneo was the son of Maria Clementina Fanus, an ironing woman in the town, and that his father, some people said, was an Englishman named O'Connor, a doctor in the salting fields. For some said the father was horsebreaker or scout from the province of El Salto. Ireneo lived with his mother at the age of the country house of the Laurels. In the years 85 and 86, we spent the summer in the city of Montevideo. We returned to Fray Bentos in 87. As was natural, I inquired after all my acquaintance and finally about the chronometer furnace. I was told that he had been thrown by a wild horse at San Francisco Ranch, and they had, he had been hopelessly crippled. I remember the impression of uneasy magic which the new provoked in me. The only time I had seen him we were on horseback coming from San Francisco and he was in a high place. From the lips of my cousin Bernardo, the affair sounded like a dream elaborated with elements out of past. They told me that Ireneo didn't move now from his cot, but remained with his eyes fixed on the backyard fig tree on a cobweb. At sunset, he allowed himself to be brought to the window. He carried pride to the extreme of pretending that the blow which had befallen him was a good thing. Twice I saw him behind the iron grate, which sternly delineated his eternal imprisonment. Unmoving, once his eyes closed, unmoving also another time, absorbed in the contemplation of sweet-smelling spring of lavender cotton. At the time I had began, not without some ostentation, the methodical study of Latin. My values contained the De Viris Illustribus of Lamont, the Caesarus of Quicherat, Caesar's commentaries, commentaries, and an odd numbered volume of Historia Naturalis of Pliny which exceeded, and still exceeds, my modest talents as a Latinist. Everything is noised around in a small town. Ireneo, at his small farm on the outskirts, was not long 
in learning uh, of the arrival of these anomalous books. He sent me a flowery, ceremonious letter in which he recalled our encounter, unfortunately brief, quote, on the seventh day of February of the year 84, end quote, and alluded to the glorious services which Don George Haedo, my uncle, dead the same year, quote, had rendered to the two fatherlands in the glorious campaign of Ituazingo, end quote and he solicited the loan of any one of the volumes to be accompanied by dictionary, quote, for the better intelligence of the original text, for I do not know Latin as yet, end quote. He promised to return them in good condition almost immediately. The letter was perfect, very nicely constructed. The orthography was of the type sponsored by André Bellot, I for Y, J for G. At first, I naturally suspected a jest. My cousins assured me it was not so, that these were the ways of Irenaeo. I didn't know whether to attribute to impudence, ignorance or stupidity the idea that difficult Latin required no other instrument than a dictionary. In order fully to undeceive him, I sent the Gradus at Parnassum of Quakerat and the Pliny. On February 14, I received a telegram from Buenos Aires telling me to return immediately for my father was, quote, in no way well, end quote. God forgive me, but the prestige of being the recipient of an urgent telegram, the desire to point out to all of Fray Bentos the contradiction between the negative form of the news and the positive adverb, the temptation to dramatize my sorrow, and I feel a veral stoicism, all no doubt distracted me from the possibility of anguish. As I packed my valise, I noticed that I was missing the Gradus and the volume of Historia Naturalis. The Saturn was to wait anchor on the morning of the next day. That night, after supper, I made my way to the house of Phanas. Outside, I was surprised to find the night no less oppressive than the day. Irenaeus' mother received me at the modest ranch. She told me that Irenao was to the back room and that I should not be dis disturbed to find him in the dark, for he knew how to pass the dead hours without lighting the candle. I crossed the cobblestone patio, the small corridor, came to the second patio. Great wine covered everything so that the darkness seemed complete. Of a sudden, I heard the high-pitched mocking voice of Irenaeo. The voice spoke in Latin. The voice which came out of the obscurity was a reading with obvious delight the traces of prayer or incantation. The Roman syllables resounded in the earthen patio. My suspicion made them seem undecipherable, interminable. Afterward, in the enormous dialogue of that night, I learned that they made up the first paragraph of the 24th chapter of the seventh book of Historia Naturalis. The subject of this chapter is memory. The last words are are Ut nihil non isdem verbis roderetur auditum. Without the least change in his voice, Irenao bade me come in. He was lying on the cot smoking. It seems to me that I didn't see his face until dawn. I seem to recall the momentary glow 
of the cigarette, the room smelled vaguely of dampness. I sat down and repeated the story of the telegram in my father's illness. Come now to the most difficult point in my narrative. For the entire story has no other point, the reader might as well know it by now, that this dialogue of the almost half century ago, I shall not attempt to reproduce his words, now irrec irrecoverable. I prefer uh, truthfully to make a resume of the many things Irene told me. The indirect style in remote is remote and weak. I know that I sacrificed the effectiveness of my narrative, but let me, my readers, imagine the nebulous sentences which clouded that night. Irene began by enumerating in Latin and Spanish the cases of prodigious memory cited in Historia Naturalis. Cyrus, king of uh, Persians, who could uh, call every soldier in his armies by name, Mithridates Eupator, who administrated justice in the 22 languages of his empire, Simonides, inventor of mnemotechny, Metrodorus, who practiced the art of repeating faithfully what he heard once. With evident good faith, Fanes marveled that such things should be considered marvelous. He told me that previous to the rainy afternoon when the blue tinted horse threw him, he had been like any Christian blind, deaf, mute, somnambulistic, memoryless. I tried to remind him of his precise perception of time, his memory for proper names, he paid no attention to me. For 19 years, he said he had lived like a person in a dream. He looked without seeing, heard without hearing, forgot everything, almost everything. On falling from the horse, he lost consciousness. When he recovered it, the present was almost intolerable. It was so rich and bright, the same was true of the most ancient and most trivial memories. A little later, he realized that he was crippled. This fact scarcely interested him. He reasoned, or felt, that immobility was a minimum price to pay. And now his perception, his memory, were infallible. We, in a glance, perceive three wine glasses on the table. Furnace saw all the shoots, clusters, grapes of the wine. He remembered the shapes of the clouds in the south and down in the 30th of April, 1882, and he could compare them in his recollection with the marbled grain in the design of leather-bound book, which he he had seen, only, had seen only once, and with the lines in the spray which on or rest in the Rio Negro on the eve of bottle of Quebracho. These recollections were not simple. Each visual image was linked to muscular sensations, thermal sensations, etc. He could reconstruct all his dreams, all his fancies, two or three times he had reconstructed an entire day, he told me, I have more memories in myself alone than all men have had since the world was a world. And again, my dreams are like your vigils. And again, toward down, my memory, sir, is like a garbage disposal a circumference on a blackboard 
a rectangular triangle, a tom, are uh, forms which can fully into it. The same held true with Ireneo for the tempestuous man of the stallion, and here the cattle in the pass, over changing flame, or the innumerable ash, the many faces of a dead man during the course of protracted wake. He could perceive, I do not know how many, stars in the sky. This thing, he told me, never then nor at any time later did they seem doubtful. In those days, never the cinema nor the photograph yet existed. Nevertheless, it seems strange, almost incredible, that no one should have experimented on Furness. The truth is that all live by leaving behind. No doubt, we all profoundly know that we are immortal, and that sooner or later, every man will do all things and know everything. The voice of Furness out of the darkness continued. He told me that toward 1886, he had devised a new system of enumeration, and that in a very few days, he had gone beyond 24,000. He had not written it down, for what he once meditated would not be erased. The first stimulus to his work, I believe, had been his discontent with the fact that, quote, 33 Uruguayans, end quote, required two symbols and three words, rougher than a single word. And single symbol. Later he applied his extravagant principle to the other numbers. In place of 7013, he would say, for example, Maximo Perez, in place of 7014, the train. Other numbers were Louis Meleon Lafinur, Olimar Brimstone, Clubs, the whale, gas, the cauldron, Napoleon, Augustine, de Vedia. In lieu of 500, he would say nine. Each word had particular sign, a species of mark. The last few were very complicated. I attempted to explain that this rhapsody of unconnected terms was precisely the contrary of the system of enumeration. I said that to say 365 was to say 300, six tenths, five units, and analysis which doesn't exist in such numbers as Negro Timoteo or the flesh blanket. Fanas didn't understand me or didn't wish to understand me. Locke, in the 17th century, postulated and rejected an impossible idiom in which each individual object, each stone, each bird, branch, had an individual name. Farnes had once projected an analogous idiom, but he had renounced it as being too general, too ambiguous. In effect, Furness not only remembered every leaf on every tree of every wood, but even every one of the times he had perceived or imagined it. He determined to reduce all of his past experience to some 70,000 recollections, which he would later define numerically. Two considerations disordered him dissuaded him. The thought that the task was interminable and the thought that it was useless. He knew that at the hour of his death he would scarcely have finished classifying even all the memories of his childhood. The two projects I have indicated 
infinite vocabulary for the natural sciences of numbers and the usable mental catalog of all images of memory are lacking in sense, but they reveal a certain stammering greatness. They allow us to make out dimly or uh, to infer the dazzling world of Fanus. He was, let's not forget, almost incapable of general platonic ideas. It was not only difficult for him to understand that the generic term dog embraced so many unlike specimens of differing sizes and different forms, he was disturbed by the fact that a dog at the 314 seen in profile should have the same name as a dog in 315 seen from the front. His own face in the mirror, his own hands surprise him in every occasion. Swift writes that the emperor of Lilliput could discern the movement of minute hand. Fanus could continuously make out the tranquil advances of corruption, of carries or fatigue. He noted that progress of death or of moisture. He was the solitary and lucid spectator of the multiform world, which was instantaneously and almost intolerably exact. Babylon, London and New York have overrode the imagination of man with their ferocious splendor, no one in those populous towers or upon those surging avenues has felt the heat and pressure of a reality as indefatigable as that which day and night converged upon the unfortunate Irenaeo is his humble South American farmhouse. It was very difficult for him to sleep. To sleep is to be abstracted from the world, furnace on his back, in his cut, in the shadows, imagine every uh, crevice and uh, every molding of the various houses which surrounded him. I repeat, the least important of his recollections was more minutely precise and more livelily than our perception of physical pleasure or physical torment. Toward the east, in a section which was not yet cut into blocks of homes, there were some new unknown houses. Furnace imagined them black, compact, made of a single obscurity. He would turn his face in his direction in, other, in order to sleep. He would also imagine himself at the bottom of the river being rocked and annihilated by the current. Without effort, he had learned English, French, Portuguese, Latin, I suspect, nevertheless, that he was not very capable of thought. To think is to forget difference, to generalize, to abstract. In the orally replete world of Fanus, there were nothing but details, almost contiguous details. The equivocal clarity of the dawn penetrated along the orphan patio. Then it was that I saw the face of the voice which had spoken all through the night. Irenaeo was 19 years old. He had been born in 1868. He seemed as monumental as bronze, more ancient than Egypt, and terrier to prophecies and the pyramids. It occurred to me that each one of my words 
Each one of my gestures would live on in his implacable memory. I was benumbed by the fear of multiplying superfluous gestures. Irene Fanus died in 1889 of a pulmonary congestion. 1942, translated by Anthony Kerrigan. The completed reading of the tale Furnace the Memorials by Jorge Luis Borges. Read by Alex Sopko.